I'm your host Scott Ramph and I'm here to tell you about everything that's happening within the world, the region, and everything that's happening within Missoula as we are slowly opening up the economy within the state of Montana. And Missoula, on the other hand, is kind of weary about how we are diving into the unknown May, going into this mostly closed, self-isolated month. Many health officials, especially in Missoula, are urging people to continue, continue social distancing. Of course, today, MCPS will address whether or not they're going to be opening their school, how they're going to do graduation. They're going to have a, um, an online Zoom meeting, and they've been doing this for the last couple of weeks. Um, they had a special meeting on Tuesday, but they're officially going to decide whether or not they're going to open the schools um, today at noon, Friday, um, May 1st. Um, and a special meeting is happening at noon today. Of course, the city continues to keep some of these stores closed amid businesses, owners, fears of a second wave of the coronavirus and more people getting infected and whatnot. Another big thing that's happening as well is that Costco is one of the places here in Missoula that has um, ha put in a mandatory wear your mask, wear a mask or a face covering thing before you go into their store. Um, already that's happening right now. One of the stores in Missoula, the Good Food Store, has already implemented a face mask, uh, no shirt, no shoes, no face mask, no service kind of type deal within the city of Missoula. So you want to um, make sure that you wear your face mask out and about. As they, as we are opening the economy, that does not mean that the coronavirus has ended. Um, many other businesses also are um, have um, sent letters, uh, called the city of Missoula, and have been like, uh, worried about this and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on along with the sleepy in motel about how the city is moving forward with uh, this isolating um, facility within the city of Missoula um, they bought this facility and later on that week governor Steve Bullock would uh, announced that he'd be doing, doing uh, phase openings within the uh, state of Montana, and Missoula is still confident that they want to continue uh, doing isolating and uh, COVID-19 testing and services for people who cannot I isolate themselves from other people, especially old folks who um, are within the city of Missoula who are in assisted living facilities who cannot, who cannot isolate themselves from other people within their facilities. So that's what the Sleepy Inn is being converted into. And I'll talk a little bit more, more about that within the uh, city council report. Um, the, uh, another big thing that's happening in the, uh, the news as well is the U.S. Uh, Labor Department has issued a report stating that 30 million people, uh, Americans, uh, applied for unemployment. Of course, this comes at a recent 3.8 million job from last week's 4.4 million jump. Um, of course, here is a graph. I'm going to be popping up a graph right here. Uh, Congress has authorized um, an ex to ex uh, expanded unemployment payments of $600 per week through July. Those benefits are available not only for ordinary payroll workers, but also gig workers uh, and the self-employed who ordinary are not eligible for unemployment benefits who will now be um, eligible for those benefits as well. Of course, part of the economy open up is that Montana has made a kind of an anti-tourism uh, video and it's Montana. It's worth the wait. Um, of course, those words might sound a little aggressive, but the Montana tourism is a big chunk of Montana's economy, but the Montana Office of Tourism wants people in other places to keep the Georgia State in mind for future vacations, but not uh, upcoming vacations for the summer. Uh, of course, while people are losing money and losing their jobs and going on unemployment, um, a lot of the silver linings that are being put in place is that the environment is improving as well. Of course, a lot of couple stories here going on here around is that Venice, Italy is a prime example about dolphins being able to swim in the canals. Canals are usually polluted with a bunch of uh, boats uh, going through their canals as well. Um, they even had a video of a jellyfish swimming through the canals as well. Uh, the um, International Energy Agency has reported a six, an 8% drop in all-around greenhouse gas emissions. A drop that large hasn't happened since World War II when coal plants were forced to close. Uh, of course, the agency is not optimistic because once the economy fully opens up, the emissions will bounce back. Uh, of course, those are a couple things and the hot news items today. Up next, I have some new programs airing on MCAT. 
but I also have Nikki Robb from uh, Missoula Gives, um, Missoula uh, Community Foundation, who are looking to um, help nonprofits within the city of Missoula through their Missoula Gives. And one of the one of the biggest issues is that um, they always set up a kiosk and places for people to donate as well. But they are strictly doing an online deal. And Nikki Robb will have more information after uh, a tease of new programs that are going to be airing on MCAT this weekend. Uh, looking at the top, this is usually the way that we um, are using explanations of data that we have. We'll focus on what's wrong rather than focus on what's right. So here, the first two statements, teens who felt unsafe at school, 8%, teens who engaged in binge drinking, 18%. Why don't we reframe that, teens who felt safe at school being at 92%, and why don't we rephrase this as teens who are drinking moderately or not at all at 82%. Let's, let's, re, let's refocus it in a way that shows what we are doing well rather than everything that we're doing poorly. The women who participated in this movement were precisely the demographic of women who embraced the values of true womanhood. Again, it was these values that led women to advocate for change. And so the critiques these women faced, once again, reflected this tension in true womanhood I talked about a moment ago. Women were understood to be the moral centers of their society. It made them want to address what they saw as moral ills. Yet their place was said to be in the home, making public advocacy inappropriate. That men from the fort had been on leave in the city on the day before, which was Sunday. So that was leave day and they were downtown and visiting bars, I assume, and girls and families or whatever on, on their leave and mixing in with the city. And on Monday morning, they, um, many of them appeared with symptoms. The health officer at the time was a physician by the name of Dr. Ritchie. And the first that he did was real common in the time, is he began asserting the no spitting rule. It was a time of TB. It was a time when spitting was you know, considered very, very bad for health, and yet it was still a fairly common practice to spit on the sidewalk. So he marched right up, and they... In, put the no spitting rule into effect. People were familiar with that rule and the editor of the Daily Missoulian roundly endorsed that rule. Mike Markovich is somebody who was on the trip with us to, to DC. You know, the summit's been a supporter of the chamber for a long time and you'll see their signs at our business after hours and we can thank them for our beverages. I think that the, you know, they, they were part of uh, the, this effort that we've gone through. And um, ever since then, the level of engagement that of being part of that process and seeing forward progress before we knew that they won the build grant has just stepped up. So I kind of like to spotlight and thank, thank them. It is really insidious, but this is the main point, right? If you're not the customer, you're the product. Paying for your news is a smart way to go, right? It can be a local newspaper. It can be a national newspaper. Um, it sounds old-fashioned. When I was putting this together, I was like, oh, I sound like, like I'm from a different century, right? But this is the fact of fake news, unfortunately, um, among, among everything else, all the other unfortunate stuff. So how does it spread? Hi, everybody. I'm here with Nikki Robb. She's with the Missoula Community Foundation, and she's here to talk about Missoula Gives. It's a little different this year, as you may already know. So, Nikki Robb, you want to take it away? Sure. Yeah, we're excited. Missoula Gives is this week, this week coming up on April 30th, kicking off at 5 p.m. and going until May 1st at 7 p.m. And in light of the current situation, we have had to make some adjustments to our giving day. You know, fortunately, this giving day is set up to be an online driven fundraiser. So we use an online platform for these nonprofits to do all their fundraising. So that was great. You know, it enabled us to make some adjustments and cancel all of our in-person events and cancel our trainings and do everything virtually. So this year we are going to be live streaming off of the MissoulaGives.org website during the giving day. So that will be both Thursday and Friday. We will take a small break in the middle of the night so everyone can get a little bit of sleep. And what but can people expect? We will uh, be back for a live streaming event, which we're really calling a celebration of Missoula. 
Nice. And what can people expect from this, um, from watching this live stream? Well, we're definitely going to be celebrating Missoula and touching base with everything that's going on with our nonprofits. You know, this year we have 138 nonprofits participating, um, and that's everything from animal organizations to youth organizations to some of our frontline organizations, you know, the food bank and the Pavarello. Uh, we've got a whole gamut of groups participating. And so this year we will have um, some promo videos and some highlights from different nonprofits who get to learn about some of the things they're fundraising for and what they're doing for our community these days. And then we'll also have some other really entertaining local things. For example, we're going to have a, a variety show happening Thursday night. Uh, we're going to have sort of a live tell us something event. We will be broadcasting on Friday, the virtual first Friday event that happens from five to six. Nice. We have a cooking show. We've got some live music performances. We've got a poetry slam. We've got some, uh, you know, a whole block in the middle of the afternoon where we're going to have some really great kids activities. So parents, make sure to tune in on Friday afternoon and get your kids entertained for a little while. Nice. Um, yeah, I mean, this is uh, sounds like it's a very, um, it's limited, but it's also a very um, um, diverse in terms of just like uh, uh, quality, quantity and all that stuff. Um, all the above, basically. Yeah, for sure. For sure. It's going to be a really unique culmination of our community streaming throughout the day. So I'm excited to see people tune in and learn about some of the great nonprofits and highlight some of the things that these guys are doing. And just to, to have a fun celebration today, we've got a couple of like energy and activity exercises. We'll do a yoga in the morning on Friday. So yeah, we've got a full jam-packed day. Not quite 26 hours, but pretty close. <laughs> so you're talking about what you guys are doing, but um, Missoula Gives is about giving. And uh, how can people give uh, through Missoula Gives? Yeah, let's talk about that for a second, because this is an online fundraiser to benefit our local nonprofit community. And due to the current situation, our nonprofits need Missoula Gives more than ever. I know it's a hard time for people and not everyone can afford to give, but if you can give, we encourage anyone to make a donation. The minimum donation is $5 and with 140 nonprofits, you're sure to find some that you have been touched by, that you care about, that you want to support during these times. So it's really easy to make a donation. All you have to do is go to missoulagives.org. There's a search bar right there. You can find that organization and simply make a donation on their page. Also, keep an eye on social media because our nonprofits are pushing their information out and, and showing exactly where you can donate. So if you're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, keep an eye out for those pages. And a lot of them have direct links that will take you to their donate page. Nice. Well, is there anything else you wanted to bring up? Um, is there, um, so what is the deadline? Uh, so this year's event um, takes place until May 1st at 7 p.m. So you have all the way through there till May 1st to make that donation and get in there and, and help these nonprofits out. Um, but you can always support these nonprofits. If you can't do it today, don't hesitate to reach out next week. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of these guys have had to cancel spring events. They've had to cancel classes. They've had to you know, stop operating, which has stopped their income. So now more than ever, we need to support our nonprofit community. So once we get through this, they are there to bring us the light that we always count on. Nice. Well, thanks, Nikki. Um, I really appreciate you coming on here as well. Um, and uh, the website where you, people can find more information about Missoula Gives is? MissoulaGives.org. Awesome. Well, thanks, Nikki. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bev beck Gluker, and I am participating again this year in the Zach Annual Print Fest. And I'd like to give a huge acknowledgement to the Zach for continuing year after year to hold the Print Fest and to nurture printmaking and printmakers in our community. It's awesome. So I'm gonna be doing one of the demos this year. And the demo that I'm gonna do is uh, a hot glue technique. And you'll have to practice a little bit first because there are you know, some control issues and things. And the line will kind of thin out. And so there's kind of a little art to it, but you get pretty good at you know, just kind of controlling the line and everything. I have a plate here that is the replica of this plate that I have actually inked up before. If you're a person that uh, you don't have a press at your home or access to a press, 
This handy tool can work really well to transfer your design. So if you just have a wooden spoon uh, working with the flat side of it, or you have a, you know, even like a rolling pin um, that you can roll over it after you've inked it up to transfer the design, perfect. This is an experimental process, so anything that you find that will work is up for grabs. Okay, so the inks that I'm using today are these um, Akua inks. These are water-based inks. They're not entirely water-soluble, but I really like these because they have some of the same kind of properties. They stay wet for a really long time so that you can apply them to a plate and you have plenty of time to kind of mess around before things start drying. So once again, I'm just kind of using these brayers like I would a paintbrush, and I'm just randomly inking. I wanted to add something, so I cut out, uh, out of some cardstock, I cut out a couple of um, turkey vultures in flight, and I've been working with the turkey vulture image um, quite a bit in the last couple of years. I'm just going to roll these turkey vultures up in black. And then I'm going to place them on my plate, set it down. And then um, I'm gonna run it through the press and it's always kind of an experiment to see what we have. And for that reason, we um, have a lot of proofs that we make in printmaking because you never actually know what you're really going to get, especially when you're using a technique like this. This um, technique is so experimental. Um, you can be as basic and simple as you want. You can create insects. You can be elaborate. You can spend a ton of time, like on the piece I was showing you earlier. Um, you can cut out additional pieces to um, add to your print, like the pieces that we've done here. So the sky's the limit, and um, I hope that you guys will take this technique, experiment, um, and look at all of the other demos, and I'm really looking forward to seeing you guys at the Print Fest uh, this year and years to come. Happy printmaking! Of course, from what you said, that was Bev Beck-Gluckert, uh, that was Steve Gluckert, the former curator at Mizzou Art Museum, and uh, they're doing a print fest, the last best print fest at the Zootown Arts Community Center, and part of this is that they wanted to do an interactive uh, vid video uh, of the print fest. They have the art on display at the Zach. As they are slowly opening places up, they want to have things on display, but they're not going to have any kind of events or social gathering events, which the Zach really utilizes a lot to uh, have people come on down. First Friday is a huge deal happening within the city of Missoula, but that's one of the things that uh, uh, the Bev Beck-Lukert did is make a couple videos uh, for the print fest that's happening this Friday at the ZAC. Um, it's not actually happening at the ZAC. They said they're going to do some kind of virtual tour. You can find more information at ZootownArtsCommunityCenter.org. Um, right now, I'm going to be talking about some pre-critic stuff, so some, some new movies, some new shows, some new things that are happening in and around. Of course, this movie um, the Willoughby's is a movie that's already been out on Netflix, uh, but I wanted to uh, harp a little bit more on this as well, uh, just to give you guys a suggestion if you want a nice family movie. Uh, but I can already tell you that this is one of those movies where the parents are just like, I want my kid to be a doctor. I want my kid to be a lawyer. And the kids are like, I want to be like an art person. And the parents are like, Burr, 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 burr. and <laughs> they have to uh, go to like a talent battle, a battle of the bands kind of deal. I don't know. It, like I saw the brief of it and it's like, they're kind of being um, <laughs> told what they have to do. And the kids are like, I'm going to fight back against my parents. Hmm. There's a lot of, there's a lot of that theme going on in this particular pre-critic. As we move on to our next topic, which is called Hannah. Hannah is based on a movie that came out many years ago where it's about a girl who's basically like Jason Bourne, who is born, raised, and trained to be all sorts of uh, plot devices within the um, movie and whatever, and she has to run away from the uh, evil corporation and some lady who happens to be her mom or something. I don't know. There has to be some drama. Everyone has to be related to each other. Star Wars. Uh, <laughs> but Hannah is a show. Uh... 
it's basically like Jason Bourne and all that stuff. And, you know, she just, you know, wants to be a normal girl. You know, TikTok, Snapchat, play some um, video games or whatever. Um, speaking of video games, and I'm mispronouncing that on purpose just to enrage people, because we got Streets of Rage Part 4, otherwise known as Streets of Rage 4, uh, from those quarter-swallowing uh, arcade games um, comes a Streets of Rage... Uh, for your console, because, you know, consoles are the only thing that exists. There's some arcades, but those are basically in bowling alleys. Uh, from the makers of the coin swallowing beat em up comes Streets of Rage 4, which follows a weak story of colorful one-dimensional characters as they fight bad guy slash woman. Of course, they are one-dimensional because one character is like, I'm a guitar, and that's what defines me. And then the person's like, I'm rugged, and I'm getting pulled back into the Streets of Rage. Um, they're very one note, and of course, like any like games trying to avoid any of the problems with censorship and uh, high uh, gore ratings, they just basically kill the bad guy by throwing him off a building, and you don't see how they die. That's kind of how they kind of have a safe uh, way of being able to fight those kind of games. But anyways, those are some of the uh, new things that are happening um, on streaming, some of the entertain you while, while you guys are still inside. Um, the, 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 it's very interesting to kind of see how... Uh, uh, how we entertain ourselves during these times about how we're kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel for just basic entertainment to get our minds off of the um, realities of what's going on in, within the <laughs> within the world today. All right, so I will be back and I'll talk a little bit more about your city council where they're talking about I mean, exactly how they're going to run um, the new uh, sleeping in motel for uh, COVID-19 patients. So I'll be right back right after this. All right, all right, all right. I've been asking you this question over and over again. I expect a different answer. For the last time, man, I don't know anything about nothing. Well, we had you at the scene of the crime, and you were clearly intoxicated. Ugh, man, so what if I had a couple drinks here and there? It's not illegal to drink, but what you did is... It's an unjust law, man! Huh, I'm sorry, are you a police officer? I didn't think so. I'm a police officer. You're not na 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 <sighs> Alright, it was dark. It was really dark, I couldn't see it. The streets were illuminated after all, sir. You can't expect me to look down all the time, and besides, it's a stupid superstition. Hmm, so you admit it? Okay, so what if I did step on a crack? It's not like my mother's- Your mother was admitted to a hospital because of her broken back! It's a lie, man! Alright, alright, let's cool our jets, guys. This perp just admitted to stepping on a crack. We got him dead to rights. Do you know the penalty for your actions? You can't prove that stepping on a crack breaks your mother's back, that's stupid! And yet here we are! After all, you're here, and your poor mother's in the hospital. Do you take any responsibilities for your actions? Well, my... That's what I thought. After all, some people don't like their mothers. I like my mama. What we see right here is your file, and on your file, it turns out that, hoo hoo hoo, you stepped on a crack more than once after all. Come on, all. man. The streets aren't even lit that well. And yet, you managed to step on every single crack. Why? Why do you hate your mama so much? What did she ever do to you? His mama probably didn't want him to go to liberal arts college. Uh, that's not the case, after all. I wanted to go to an Ivy League school. Uh, you can understand that, right? Well, well, I might be a simple uh, detective around these parts, but I don't know anything about no Ivy League college. Of course you don't. But I do know that you broke the law. Yep. And around these parts. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Ah, it's funny that he gets it. Why is it that most people get it after they commit the crime in the first yeah, place? Yeah, they don't <laughs> farm. <laughs> Alright, let's... Let's send this guy over to the pen. He knows what he did. Just looking at his face makes this me sick. This is cold, man. This is cold! I don't think so. Do you think we should throw away the key? He has mommy back cracker after all. You know what they do to people like you in prison? <laughs> you see what I did in there? I totally intimidated him. Really cool, man. Really cool. Hmm. Hi guys, I hope you enjoyed that uh, uh, Dublin stuff as much as I did. Um, that was uh, from the movie um, Kansas City Confidential. 
as you already saw. Um, moving on, let's talk about some city council, not confidential, as they are um, still doing their Zoom meetings online, and the city of Missoula was doing a shorter, uh, but they did dive into more of the operations of the CPN as the coronavirus quarantine facility for those who cannot isolate themselves during these times. The city talked more about in length on Monday. Amber Sherrill reflects on the opening of the economy in Montana. Um. Also, I just want to remind people that as our restrictions lessen, there was a great comment I heard today from the Prime Minister of New Zealand that said we are opening up our economy, not people's social lives. And that is a hard one as an extrovert for me to um, get, but I think that that is uh, really important just to remember that piece of it. Also of course, as the city continues their social distancing meeting, you can get in contact with the city. You can go to ci.missoula.mt.us. It is a way for you guys to email them. Um, you, it's also info at ci.missoula.mt.us is their general inbox. And public comments, um, you can uh, Google um, Missoula City of Missoula public comments, and they should be able to get you to a page where you can submit your public comments. But you can also call them at 552 6,000. Again, that number is 552 or 6,000. All right, so Montana uh, Governor Steve Bullock, as you know, has opened the economy for phase one, which includes retail, small business, salons, and bars and gyms, and other social gathering event space, which will remain closed. Uh, bars and um, bars, large events, uh, concerts, and stuff like that. They're, they're saying is that we're not quite ready for those yet. We'll see how this first phase goes in with a couple of these other stores that are opening retail and other small business in the downtown Missoula area. So they're trying to figure that out. Schools, on the other hand, like I said, are going to be deciding whether or not they're going to be opening this Friday, um, today at noon. Uh, so they'll talk about that as well, so statewide. But of course, um, Parks and Recreation have also said that uh, their parks are closed. And um, just, just common sense, thinking about it right here and there, um, do not touch the playground. The Missoula Parks and Rec do not clean the playground. And that's, that's like all around. They never clean the playground. There's no, like, I mean, there's no person who goes around and cleans the playgrounds. They might do it uh, once in a while, but they don't do it every single day. And there's just not enough staff and people and money available to keep those places clean for your children. So think about that when moving forward with going to, uh, going to recreate out in the parks. Uh, you can go out into the parks and the trails because you don't really have to worry about touching anything, but playgrounds, you got to watch out for that. And the Parks and Rec are urging people to do that as well, as long as well as MCPS are asking people to not play on their playgrounds as well. Um, so MCPS said that their playgrounds are closed, and you can check that out at the MCPS's website, mcpsmt.org. Of course, the city uh, council talks about the Sleepy Inn and the future of this potential property. Here is uh, Mayor John Engen. Um, so first, we did close on the facility uh, this afternoon, and uh, we have the keys, but after your vote, uh, last week, Adrian Beck and her team began uh, further assessment of condition of facility and planning for uh, any remediation that needs to happen in advance of occupancy. Uh, and that work <clears throat> can begin in earnest. She did some scheduling last week, and that work can begin in earnest this week. Of course, part of the scrutiny of the city face was the take price and the overall status of the facility to be used. Um, but the city said that they would be able to get things ready by the end of the week or next. Uh, of course, part of this opening would be uh, the money would be from FEMA. And part of it, uh, they said 75% would be uh, federally funded. 25% would be um, Montana state funded. Um, which would go towards operating and managing folks in the community who have no place to isolate as the... Many places uh, are not admitting folks, and the POV also, uh, Pavarella Center, uh, the homeless shelter in Missoula, also said they would not admit people who had the COVID-19. Um, and they did that earlier this year as well as we were closing down the stores. Uh, Dale Bickle talks more about the costs associated with the new property and running it. Um, Dale the facility property um, insurance will be, will be uh, um, covered by the city's um, insurer, MMIA. Um, and as well as liability for the city's actions related to uh, the operation of the shelter. Missoula County has a similar policy um, on, for their actions, and um, there is an overall uh, umbrella policy that we are seeking from a third party. We received quotes uh, today on that, 
and um, it's and uh, we're planning to enter into that as stated we're using our best efforts to find a third party insurance. Dale mentions that the Office of Emergency Management will take the lead on running these through the county. Uh, this would cost uh, $1,666 a day, one six 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 a day to operate the facility, but we'll get reimbursed as soon as the uh, county um, starts running it. So in short run, the county, the city bought this so the county would run it using FEMA and state dollars. Um, the, the future of the site, of course, is up to the city. Uh, um, and when the um, pandemic clears, the site can be used for future development, low-income housing, that kind of thing. That's the kind of long-term goal. Um, Adrian Beck, uh, with the Office of Emergency Management talks about the benefits of having ownership of this facility. Because the facility will be under government kind of control and operation and ownership, uh, we had to take some of the operational costs that we factored in and subtract those from what would be a normal room rate that you would pay at a, at a local hotel. So coming to the $49 per unit per night uh, was really just a way to, to kind of quantify what we were going to pay for that facility use. It's important to keep in mind that we're not necessarily tying that that uh, that lease payment to the number of people that we have in there, because really our intention is to have control over the entire facility. So, through um, as as Dale mentioned, in order to have both the city and the county kind of jointly making decisions about the operation of that facility, uh, Ms. Pehan and I will be working uh, closely together to to talk through kind of what makes the most sense based on the population that is going to be housed there in close coordination, obviously, with the health department. Erin Pian, as she was mentioned by Adrian Beck, um, she's with the housing and community develop. She's the housing and community development director, who is usually the one working with ho lo homeless, low income, and trying to f uh, low and low income programs to help people get into housing and trying to figure out uh, additional housing that can be put onto development within the city of Missoula, so they can have low. Um, uh, uh, lower rent apartments built in with those uh, bigger units as well. Of course, Adrian Beck with the Office of Emergency Management said that the facility, the facility will start putting people in uh, Tuesday, um, starting the end of this week um, as today or sometime next week. Um, part of this is um, Aaron Leahy talks about moving forward on COVID testing through these means. And as we begin expanding our testing, now that the Centers for Disease Control, as of Friday, came out with new symptoms that have been shown to be associated with COVID, that really opens the door in our screening of who is eligible for testing much wider than it has been. And um, I expect that that alone will um, increase the need for this facility. So I'm very- Ellen Leahy um, with the Missoula City um, um, County, Missoula uh, City County Health Department mentions that the rooms will get new mattresses and sanitizing rooms. One of the questions asked was, how long would this facility need to be operated? And this is how uh, Ellen responds to that. What we generally do to mark the end of an outbreak is we go two full incubation periods without any new cases before you would say that outbreak is, is over. So for pertussis, that could be 21 times two, so 42 days. If you get a new case in there, you start your clock again. With um, infectious diseases that are a little harder to test for or to know that they're present, um, as is sometimes the case, we might sometimes be a little more prudent and go with three incubation periods. So at the very least with COVID, um, the very least would be two incubation periods. And I would say that we'd want to make sure that we were not in a, a seasonal um, reduction of disease, as you sometimes see with respiratory viruses. Um, so probably we would see how it looks in the fall. Uh, for when you have a person who has the virus, they have that 14-day quarantine. Um, she also mentioned that uh, pertussis, otherwise known as whooping cough, has a longer isolation period. So she kind of used that as an example uh, about how long it needs to uh, happen for uh, to avoid the spread of the disease as well. Many health officials say that there could be another wave going into the fall and acting rash is in going back 
to the status quo. It could be uh, very bad. Jesse Ramos is concerned that the state's uh, May 10th deadline, so of course the state 10th of May deadline is that's when a lot of the, the phase and a lot of the stores are going to be more open to the old kind of status quo economy type deal. Um, and uh, part of this would uh, with this whole opening is that Jesse thinks that uh, because the state has decided to open the economy that FEMA would no longer continue funding and this is what he had to say um, about that. As in the FEMA letter it says my approval is limited to the activities and costs associated with sheltering individuals through May 10th 2020 unless the public health needs uh, terminate earlier the state must obtain an additional approval for time extensions uh, which must include reassessment of continuing need for emergency NCS from a state or local public health official, as well as detailed justification for continuing need for the emergency NS. So the reason why I'm asking is just because this approval only extends to the 10th, and if we're a week out, I mean, that's going to put us literally almost a, just, just one week of approval um, and, until uh, May 10th. So obviously, I'm sure uh, Ms. Leahy will um, probably try and extend that. That's fine. But right now, this letter that we have only approves uh, the usage through May 10th. So that's just why I was curious about it, because it just seems like we just made a $1.1 million purchase. God knows how much in approvals. Um, and, and we're only going to have the thing for a week, um, potentially. So that, that's just why I was asking that question. And, of course, Adrian Beck responds to Jesse Ramos and talks about how they can get further funding through FEMA. There are three classifications of individuals that are qualified to be housed in non-congregate shelter. Uh, the first is obviously those that are under a, an isolation order for a health officer, those people that have tested positive and need to self-isolate uh, and to recover from, from the illness uh, for fear that they would um, infect other people. The other category is those that need to quarantine uh, for a health officer's order for, for the same purposes. They may not have tested positive yet. They may be awaiting a test result, but they have been exposed to COVID and are likely to either become positive or need to, to provide uh, for that, that quarantine period. The third classification of individuals are those that are deemed um, high risk for the CDC guidance. So those, those individuals that are 65 and older that have underlying health conditions that also have nowhere else to go as far as um, to self-isolate uh, while just prevent, preventing their exposure in the community. There's a lot of information here, um, but the opening of, the, of Montana should not affect the need for something that is helpful and contain further spread. The city will have uh, to prove to FEMA that funding is warranted past the May 10th deadline. They have to apply, um, but with everything else happening in the U.S. and the U.S. Department is uh, confident in operating the facility. Uh, of course, the city voted a 9-3 vote in the city of Missoula moving forward with the Sleepy Inn as the uh, facility to operate and help folks who need a place to isolate during this pandemic. Um, and also a big thing that happened within the city of Missoula, um, um, they, they, they removed the uh, meeting times. Um, the city of Missoula will no longer meet at 7 p.m. on Mondays. They have moved it up an hour. So the city of Missoula city council meetings will start at 6 p.m. Uh, Monday evenings, um, except for the fifth Monday of the month and if the Monday falls on a holiday. Um, so the city of Missoula will continue doing um, social uh, distancing meetings online. You can contact them. Again, the number is... Um, 552-6000. You can also go onto the city's website, ci.missoula.mt.us. Um, Missoula is moving at a slower pace at opening some of the stores, and a lot of this is based on uh, the uh, skepticism that a lot of the businesses within the um, Missoula business, downtown business um, group, um, I think it's MBI, um, with it, uh, they, are, they sent letters and they sent... Um, um, they uh, called, emailed, and all that stuff to the city of Missoula, showing their concerns that this might be a little too soon for them to open. And the and the city county health department has uh, taken uh, has listened to this. Um, I have another uh, video from the city county health department. I'm going to show you right now, which gives you the most recent update on how the city is um, working through COVID and moving forward, and about how the reaction with opening the economy is all about, especially within the city of Missoula. So check this out. Hi, my name is Cindy Farr and I'm the Incident Commander for the Missoula City County Health Department's COVID-19 response. Today is Thursday, April 30th, and this is my daily briefing. We've had a total of 41 cases to date in Missoula County. 39 of those cases were identified by testing and two were epi-linked. We have had 40 recoveries and one death. 
and we have no active cases in isolation currently, but we do continue to follow our remaining close contacts. The state of Montana has had a total of 453 cases and has had 16 deaths. So we have zero active cases right now, which is clearly something to celebrate. However, that doesn't mean that this outbreak is over or that it's time to change our behavior. We just ended the stay at home directive, which had a large part in stopping the spread of COVID-19, minimizing the contacts and keeping our cases low. The zero active cases is a sign that social distancing measures really worked. Still, we need to ensure that any cases that have not been identified in the community don't change as activity um, in our community increases. I just want people to remember that COVID-19 is challenging in a few ways. So first, people can spread the virus before they show symptoms and people with mild cases may not recognize that they have it. This means that unsuspecting people could give the virus to someone and not realize that they're actually sick. Secondly, we're just now getting the resources to test as widely as we need to and have an expanded symptom list that captures the more mild cases of the disease. Again, this means that we could have people who don't realize that they have it. So if you have a fever, coughing, difficulty breathing, chills, sore throat, um, muscle aches, vomiting or diarrhea, um, again, Coughing, difficulty breathing are, are really um, the most indicative ones, but some of those other symptoms could also potentially be COVID-19. So it's really important that if you have any of those symptoms, please call our hotline at 258-INFO, that's 258-4636, and um, get a, a test scheduled. Um, thirdly, the incubation period for COVID can be up to two weeks. This means that we could have people who were exposed and don't know it yet. So vigilance is still really important. Only after several incubation periods with no new cases can we really start considering that COVID has not continued to spread. Um, same thing when we look at phases of reopening, we will need to look at our numbers, not just day by day, but in increments of the incubation period of 14 days. So the last thing that I wanna talk about today is um, that later today we plan to release some epidemiological data on the cases that we've had in Missoula to date. So um, keep an eye out for that information on our website and also on our Facebook page. So my daily briefing was really short today. That's all I have for you. Um, as always, you can subscribe on YouTube under my name, Cindy Farr, that's C-I-N-D-Y-F-A-R-R. Um, click that little notification bell so you get notified whenever new videos are uploaded. You can follow us on Facebook. Um, as I just said, we'll be releasing some more information today um, on our epidemiological da data on our cases. So you'll, you can find that on the Missoula City County Health Department's Facebook page. Um, check our website at missoula.co slash cvirus. And as always, you can schedule a test if you are having any of those symptoms at 258-INFO, or you can call that information line if you just have other general questions about COVID-19 or um, are needing to connect with some resources. Um, that's it for today. So everybody stay healthy and I will talk to you again tomorrow. All right, welcome back. Um, that pretty much does it for my show. I want to thank you guys for joining me. There's a lot of information out there as well. Uh, the Sleepy Inn, um, a big thing that's happening within the city of Missoula. Um, the city of Missoula um, also taking um, stock and slowing down openings of certain places within the city of Missoula. Um, interesting thing about how a lot of stores are now requiring people to wear face masks before they have before they allow entry to some of those stores. Um, I think that's a trend that might be continuing on throughout the city of Missoula. A lot of workers, I want to give a shout out to a lot of the service industry workers, a lot of people who are working through this pandemic and um, basically um, kind of like having a pickup but still being able to uh, um, take your orders, drive throughs and all that stuff. Um, there's a lot of things happening and this is uh, something that's co continually ongoing as we are reopening the economy. There's always that chance that the spread could continue. Montana is one of those few lucky places where we have uh, over a million people, where we have plenty of square miles within our state to avoid each other for the most part. So. Um, Isolating isn't too hard, but we all still have to uh, take personal responsibility about how we are moving forward with isolating ourselves. So I want to thank you guys for joining me and for Wake Up Missoula. I'm Scott Ramp. I'll see you guys next week.